is seven o'clock, so I will get us started here. This is going to be the finale on this webinar series. Um, haven't talked a whole lot on what the next step is, but I'm sure there's going to be more information to come and um, we'll continue to be putting out information. Just I'm not sure exactly what form that is. Maybe that's webinars in the future. We'll see. But for now, we're going to wrap things up. Um, Dale, do you want to start sharing your presentation? I can do that. I think you should be ready to go there. What are you going to be talking about tonight? I'm basically going to be talking about uh, using annual forages, primarily cover crops, to uh, splice in with uh, perennial grasses and uh, create year-round grazing. And we, we've talked a lot about how um, economically the biggest hole in the bucket of a livestock producer is the feeding of hay or silage or other stored forage. So if we can do that far cheaper with grazing, um, makes a big impact on the bottom line. So that's what we're going to cover tonight. So um, Awesome. Well, I'm going to mute myself and I'll stop my video, but um, if you have questions or anything, you guys can go ahead and type those into the chat bar or the Q&A and we'll get to those at the end. We'll let Dale start on his presentation here and uh, we'll, I, I'm just going to go. Okay, that's it. Okay, well, uh, we'll start off with a KGLC mission and uh, to regenerate Kansas grazing lands through cooperative management, economics, ecology, production, education, technical assistance programs. First, we have our non-discrimination statement. Uh, we are um, institutions participating with USDA, which is what we are. Um, we are barred from discriminating against anyone. And uh, if you uh, need an alternate form of this, please uh, contact us and uh, let us know. We can see what we can do about providing uh, accommodation. And uh, most importantly for this, I don't get myself or anybody else in trouble. The views expressed by me do not reflect the entirety of KGLC or the USDA. And uh, I, it's, I'm not addressing anything super controversial, but you never know. So um, these are mine, not the USDA or KGLC. So um, bring up the presentation itself. Okay, providing year-round grazing. Now, it is, it's actually very easy to graze 12 months out of the year. You have a pasture, you leave the animals out there 12 months out of the year. And uh, the problem is, is that it's difficult to provide quality grazing 12 months out of the year because there just are no forages that provide quality 12 months out of the year. Um, just People ask me, what should I plant for pasture? I said, well, what do you want? What's your criteria? They said, I want something that's um, going to be good 12 months out of the year and uh, be very productive, high in protein, not need fertilizer, and uh, oh yeah, seeds got to be cheap. There is no such plant. <laughs> there just isn't, folks. Um, and, and as we've talked about cool season grasses, warm season grasses, um, you should begin to understand that um, in a part of the world where we have very hot summers and very cold winters and a lot of time in between, there just isn't anything that's going to grow well 12 months out of the year. And it's during that vegetative growth period that the quality comes in. So lacking something that can grow vegetatively 12 months out of the year. It's going to be difficult to provide quality grazing 12 months out of the year. So it's going to take some, some thought processes, you know, some intelligent planning to get a year-around grazing system put together. And this is 
honestly, one of my funnest things to do is put together a plan for year round grazing. I, I really enjoy doing it. Uh, I think it's something I'm, I'm pretty good at. And, um, it's, uh, it's like putting a puzzle together. You, you can fill in the missing pieces and uh, one of the ways we do that is with annual cover crops. Um, so quality forages, uh, usually most forages have better quality in the vegetative stage than they do after they bloom. And then you have to take the animal needs into account as well. What is the status, nutrient status, or nutrient need status of your animal? Um, you know, are you looking at, like up here in the corner, we've got something that appears to be rodeo stock. Maybe you don't want them gaining weight. <coughs> Excuse me, lactating animals going to have much higher nutrient needs than a mature non-lactating animal. Dairying animals going to have much higher nutrient needs than a beef animal. Um, and of course, if you are grass finishing, you need good, maybe not exceptional quality, but you need good quality. And you honestly need good quality for about 18 to 24 consecutive months. That's the real problem with grass finishing is that people say, oh, I'll just finish on grass. You really need to have consistent high quality 12 months out of the year for about a year and a half to two years. That's what makes grass finishing. Anybody can produce grass fed beef, grass finished beef of good eating quality takes a little more doing. Um, this is the beef cow year essentially, and it's it shows essentially how after calving um, this beef cow year. Um, there are similar curves for other livestock species, sheep, goats, whatever. Um, basically, after birth, the animal needs go up because they have to get rebred. And then um, after they get rebred, usually the milk production requirements, the nutrient needs of the mother go down, but the calf or the the lamb or the kid, their needs keep increasing as they go up. Now this is total forage needs, not just necessarily the, uh, the quality. Uh, the quality, the peak quality is in this calving to breeding interval in here. This is when you need peak quality, but here is when you need peak quantity. And then the lowest nutrient needs of the year are here immediately after weaning. And I just put in, you know, this period here, about six month period in between uh, calving and weaning in this one. So um, this just illustrates the difference in quality that the animals need between um, lactation and uh, during right after weaning and mid gestation. There's about a 50% increase in protein needs and almost a doubling in energy needs. Um, and the problem is, as we've discussed before, our perennial forages, um, you know, if you remember the, that curve that went up towards the end of the season, and unfortunately our grasses tend to have a front-loaded production curve. And we've got back-loaded demand. So the production is going down as the season progresses and our needs are going up as the season progresses. So what do we do about that? And uh, this just illustrates the quality. And if you look at animal performance, you look at this, you can see that as the months progress, the quality goes down the animal performance goes down. And remember when we talked about native grasslands, this is why we went looked at something with a, an intensive early stocking concept to take a graze a higher percentage of the grass during the early season when it's highest quality and then get off 
and let the grass recover in the late season. Um, and native grass is not alone. You see that um, cool season grasses like brome grass have this, um, I guess you'd call it a bimodal curve, um, but you can see the production is about twice as high in the spring as it is in the fall. And this, this is unavoidable, folks. There's nothing we can really do about this because this is a, a chart I got from a solar power company. And it measures, the blue line here measures the amount of solar energy throughout the year. You can see it reaches a peak in June, June 21st to be exact. And then by December, it's at a low. So we will always, if we are fully, we've talked a lot about capturing sunlight capturing rainfall, capturing sunlight. And using that rainfall, we can store the sunlight or store the rainfall and capture and store as much rainfall as we can to allow us to capture as much sunlight as we can. If we capture every photon, this is what our grass production curve will look like. And it still does not look like that backloaded curve that we saw for cow demand. What do we do about this? I mean, this, this is just, we're gonna have less sunlight and lower temperatures in fall and winter than in spring and summer. We just will. Um, so what do we do about it? Well, you can supplement. You can provide those animals hay or grain uh, to fill in those production curves. You will find that this is a very expensive way of doing it. Um, this is very common, uh, especially among smaller producers. The pasture runs out, well, let's just start feeding hay or feeding grain. This is a great way of beating up your pasture and having a very expensive bill at the end of the year. Um, this is not what I typically recommend. If you're going to feed hay, um, have a sacrifice paddock where you lock them in because what happens when you feed hay on pasture the animals will typically eat a little bit of hay but they prefer any green grass to that hay you may think you're doing your pasture a favor you're not you're allowing them to stay out there they will continue to beat the pasture up and uh, if you really want to overgraze a pasture do exactly what's being done in this picture Put horses out there and feed hay on it to keep the horses alive well past what the the pasture can support. Um, grain is a little better because animals do prefer grain to green pasture um, but the amount of grain that you can give to an animal without upsetting the rumen and making it too acidic to efficiently digest forage is very limited. So I would not, um, this is not my favorite approach. Uh, I'll just cut it off, cut the discussion off and say that. I think it's the most expensive and the least productive. Another thing is to just simply stockpile forage. So have a low stocking rate. And um, so that ensures that there's some grass left over so animals don't starve. And this is honestly the way we have managed our season long pastures. You know, I've showed you the growth curves and everything. And most of the production occurs in the first half of the season, whether it's a cool season or warm season grass. And this looks good from a distance. If you look off here, look at that tall grass. But when you look up close, you see all this overgrazing when you got this grass that's never been bitten. And then towards the end of the season, all the regrowth is gone. There's no quality out there. They're forced to eat that very mature forage and their production predictably goes really downhill. So another solution is simply to get rid of animals. And one way of doing this is to take advantage of that 
spring flush, the early summer abundance, um, have more animals out there and then get rid of those animals about midway through the season. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Um, now it doesn't have to be, and I recommend not getting rid of cows unless there's some reason, um, but you could uh, carry over stalker animals, graze them the half, first half of the second year, or you could add another livestock enterprise out there. Something like, <laughs> excuse me, it's ragweed season. Um, you could add a pastured uh, pork enterprise or pastured poultry, something like that. Depends, of course, on the size and scale that you want to deal with, but and those tend to be very profitable enterprises. And then my favorite way, and what's going to take up the rest of the discussion, is simply to add more acres. If your productivity per acre is going down in the latter half of the season, just add in more acres. You know, if this is a wheat field that's been harvested or it's cornfields, have something green and growing in there, capturing sunlight, converting it into something useful, and splice those additional acres in as you need them. Okay, so what can you plant to provide off-season grazing? So um, the perennial forages, we talked about cool season perennials in an earlier webinar, April and May, when you have that spring peak, and then again, and you have a fall peak, essentially in October. And then warm season perennials, the first half of summer, they're at their prime, May, June, July, and then greatly diminishing over the rest of the year. So if we're going to, uh, what does that leave us? When are we still short? Well, a lot depends when are you giving birth and when are you weaning? Because a lactating animal, um, cow, a, a beef cow that's, that has a calf at side or you know, a, a ewe or a, a nanny that has a young animal at their side that's lactating, they need high quality feed. And you don't need high quality, unless you're doing grass finishing or um, round the year dairy production on pasture, you don't need green vegetative forage 12 months out of the year. But you do need green growing forage that's high quality from birth to weaning. And so the best tip I can give you is time your non-lactating period when, when the cows or, or ewes or whatever are dry, not milking, to the time when it's most difficult to supply high quality forage. Now, the most difficult times in general to provide high quality forage with perennials alone are these times here. So this seemed a lot of times if you notice. So uh, we'll talk about each of these. Best crops for late summer grazing. Um, I think one of the biggest advances in, in forage nutrition or forage production, nutrition, forage based animal production is the discovery of the brown midrib genetics. They're most common in sorghum, but they also exist in corn and pearl millet. And just show you this, this is where animals went in. And you can see there, this, these are the same hybrid with and without a BMR parent. This is 10 days later. The animals are eating the stalks of the BMR hybrid, the brown midrib versus the leaves, this is still relatively untouched over here after 10 days. And just take a look at the animal performance, 187, which is pretty good in West Texas versus 2.84. And another great advance, I think, in sorghum genetics is the dwarf gene, the brachytic dwarf. And Unfortunately, that you know, calling something a dwarf gives the uh, gives people the notion that this is not productive. Uh, it is short, 
but if you look at these two plants, which of these appears to be heavier? Which one has more leaves, wider leaves, longer leaves, more abundant leaves? And it's obviously the dwarf to the right. So these are for summer grazing, these dwarf sorghum sedans are just really a dominant product in that niche. And this is the, the product I almost always recommend for summer grazing. Um, just to show how productive they are, the thing that really makes them stand out is their regrowth ability. This is a trial I did a few years back compared a tall BMR to a short BMR, or I guess a, a brachytic dwarf BMR, to be precise, and look at the regrowth versus on the, the dwarf versus the lack of regrowth on a standard tall product. It is this constant, continual flush of regrowth that makes this stuff so much better. Uh, pearl millet is another uh, summer annual forage that we, we sell a lot of. Um, I really do like pearl millet. Um, one of the advantages of pearl millet over sorghum, I guess there's two of them, I would say. One is that it uh, does not have prussic acid. It, uh, it's freedom of prussic acid. The only time I really get concerned about prussic acid poisoning is around the time of first frost in the fall. Um, freshly frosted sorghums can be quite high in prussic acid. Pearl millet, because it's prussic acid free, very safe. It's also safe for horses. Not all summer annual grasses are. Pearl millet is one that is very safe for horses. Um, pearl millet does not grow as a at, as low a temperatures as what sorghum will. It needs a little bit warmer soil. So it shuts down a little earlier in the fall. You can't plant it quite as early in the spring as you can sorghum. One other advantage that pearl millet has is it is much more tolerant of uh, calcareous soils, ones that where sorghum gets iron chlorosis. So if you have those chalky white areas where sorghum just gets those yellow and green stripes on it, sign of iron chlorosis, I would consider pearl millet for those spots. And oftentimes we will grow them in combination. In fact, uh, typically when I put together a summer grazing mix, I'll have you know eight or nine species out there, including most of these next few I'm gonna name off. Um, Japanese millet. Japanese millet, its claim to fame is that it will grow in standing water. Um, nutritionally, production-wise, it's not, not great. It's inferior to pearl millet in both, but because it will grow in very wet, saturated soil, uh, even grow through an inch or so of standing water, it will produce in places other summer annual forages can't. And, you know, summer 2019, that was a very valuable trait to have. You would have, um, if Japanese millet was in the mix, you'd have Japanese millet instead of, uh, instead of a bunch of weeds in some of those wet areas. Crabgrass. Crabgrass is, of course, uh, usually considered a weed for good reason. Uh, but it is a fantastic grazing plant. Uh, very high quality, very productive. And one thing that's really unusual for a summer annual grass, it's got pretty good shade tolerance. So I like to use crabgrass as an understory to taller, more productive grasses, and it fills in the gaps. And like if I have a combination of dwarf BMR sedan grass, and crabgrass together. Um, usually in that combination, if I plant them in May, I'll get three grazing passes through it in the rotational grazing system. The first pass looks like it's 100% sorghum sedan. 
is just more productive than the crabgrass. The second pass looks like about 75% sorghum sedan and the last pass, maybe 50% sorghum sedan. The crabgrass gets thicker and thicker each and every grazing pass. And instead of having this you know, downward stair step of productivity throughout the season, like you might get with a monoculture sorghum sedan, the crabgrass by filling in those gaps can maintain an even level of productivity throughout the entire summer grazing period. Big, big fan of crabgrass. It's really a, a good, good product uh, because people have dealt with it as a weed for years and years. They are reluctant to use it on cropland, um, but it's, it's a dynamite forage. Brown top millet's one we're using more and more of. One of the neat things about brown top millet is that it really maintains its quality after maturity. You know, most, most plants, once they get mature, headed out and you see the seed, the quality is just gone. Brown top millet is a bit of an exception to that. It's still better, you know, vegetative than headed out. But once it heads out, it does not lose quality near to the extent of some other forages. So I, I like to put brown top millet, anything I'm going to use for a winter stockpile, um, I like to throw brown top millet in. Anything that's going to be used in the fall rather than during the summer, brown top millet seems to work on just about every soil. I've become, I haven't found a place where brown top millet does not work well, to be honest with you. One of my favorite summer annual plants now. Um, now moving into summer annual legumes, cowpeas are kind of a standard. They're heat tolerant, they're drought tolerant, and have good forage quality. Um, despite their having good forage quality, um, they're often initially unpalatable to animals. They have a, if you take a cowpea leaf and, and crush it up, it has a weird smell to it. Animals that are not familiar with cowpeas, a lot of times just refuse to eat them initially. Once they're forced to it um, and have to eat a cowpea, then they figure out they actually like cowpeas. Um, and uh, they're very nutritious. Um, Cowpeas do best in soils that are slightly acid. For those of you that have more alkaline soils, we'll talk about some other alternatives. Uh, mung beans. Mung beans are one of the cheaper summer annual legumes. Um, they have small seeds, which means you get a lot of seeds in a pound. They're also probably the most palatable of the summer annual legumes. Um, and even, even insects notice that. You plant mung beans and uh, the grasshoppers uh, ignore the cowpeas for the most part and go over and start eating the mung beans. So uh, I like to have some mung beans in a mix. They're kind of the gateway legume, I guess. Um, animals will eat the mung beans initially and then start working on the cowpeas. Um, but great addition. They are a shorter maturity. So they will grow just as fast as cowpeas initially, but they will, you know, they've got about a 60 to 70 day, five day maturity. So they'll produce their pods and just stop, stop growing. So um, if I were to pick, if I only had one plant to use and I had to choose between mung, mung beans and cowpeas, if I had a short growing window, I'd go with the mung beans. If I had a long growing window, I'd go with the cowpeas. Cowpeas also vine, so they will climb up companion plants a little better. Sun hemp. Sun hemp is the most productive of the summer annual legumes. One of the least palatable, but it makes more biomass, more nitrogen than any of the other legumes we've, we've messed with. Um, really prefer it in a mix because of that lesser palatability. It's got some alkaloids in it that Animals will readily eat small amounts of it. Uh, you do not want to force your animals to eat too much of it. Um, just, uh, I, I often uh, liken it to jalapenos. You know, it's better as a spice than it is as a meal. Um, as I found out in, on my trip to Texas last weekend, um, 
a meal of jalapenos does bad things. Um, so um, there is variety that we're, we're trying to get seed production on that is very palatable cattle, low alkaloid variety, very excited for that to happen. In the meantime, this is something else we're looking at. Hemp sesbania, this is something that been highly recommended to us, uh, appears to be very productive. Uh, it gets very tall. Don't know what the dry matter content per acre of that is, but you know, when it's eight, nine feet tall, there's gotta be something to it. Um, looks like it would coexist well with uh, some of the summer annual grasses. Um, and reports are that it has very good palatability to livestock. So this is one we're evaluating taking a look at. Another one we're evaluating is Lab Lab. And Lab Lab has been used in the deer industry, the deer food plot industry for years and years. Not so much for forage. Um, the varieties of Lab Lab that are on the market, um, uh, Wrong Guy and Highworth are too long a maturity to be produced in the United States. So most of that seed is produced in Australia and then shipped over here on a boat, which makes it quite expensive. The variety you're looking at here is one called Ruby Moon. It's a very short season variety. Um, you know, as you can tell, it's an incredibly attractive plant. Really beautiful flowers. The pods are bright purple. Um, just really pretty. Also very palatable. And it's drought tolerant, productive, and much more tolerant of high pH soils than what cowpeas are. I mean, they perform very similar to cowpeas, but appear to have a niche, a little better fit going west than what cowpeas do. So excited to uh, see what we can do going forward with uh, some of our own selections of Lab Lab. Um, this is Korean Lespedeza. It's an annual Lespedeza. Do not confuse this with Sericea Lespedeza, which is a perennial. The Korean Lespedeza is non-bloating. It is an annual, as you might expect, because it's called annual Lespedeza. Um, not real productive, but it's exceptional quality and it's non-bloating. Uh, but one of the really neat things about it is its tolerance to 2,4-D. Um, if you have broadleaf weed issues that you simply cannot control with grazing animals, you need to take those broadleaves out, like you know some ragweed or something like that, but still want a legume, uh, this is the have your cake and eat it to legume. Uh, because it once the plants get about six inches tall or taller, they're quite quite resistant to 2,4-D. Um, dicamba will still take them out, but not a big chance of it becoming a weed. Um, it's fairly small and non-competitive. Um, and it does reseed itself very well. So even though it's an annual, you can put it into perennial pastures and expect it to keep reseeding. Very nice little legume, uh, worked with it for Oh gosh, you know, 30 some years now. And uh, really like it, big, big Lespedeza fan. Uh, uh, this is not a legume. This is, uh, if you're from the South at all, you recognize okra. And uh, I used to pick okra when I was a kid and uh, always hated doing it. I liked eating okra, but I hated picking it because the leaves are so itchy. Um, and I thought this plant has, can't possibly have any grazing value. I was wrong. Animals love this stuff. It's got a huge taproot. It's a member of the cotton family. Um, so it's adds some diversity to the pasture. Um, apparently has some uh, effects on, on expelling internal parasites, you know, intestinal worms. Um, it seems like animals really go for it. Nothing I would have at a super high rate in a grazing mix, but I always like to throw a pound an acre in it. It is a heat loving plant. It's also pretty tolerant of salt and calcareous so, uh, soils. 
So it will go some places where some of the other summer annual plants not. Um, and then early fall grazing. And by early fall, um, usually consider that from 1st of September to frost, which is kind of a, I, I guess I'd call it a special period um, because that's when our summer perennial grasses are most uh, susceptible to uh, overgrazing. I guess that's when they're trying to put root reserves. So I really don't wanna be grazing my warm season perennial grasses at that time. I could be grazing my summer annual mixtures, all of the plants that I've previously discussed and, and obviously that's an option. Um, but a lot of times I wanna have, I have those in some sort of double crop system where I have a summer annual and a winter annual on the same piece of ground at different times of the year. I wanna get my winter annuals planted on those acres. So it's sometimes it's difficult to find high quality grazing in September, September to frost. So that's what I call the early fall grazing period. And the, the best early fall grazing is with um, a cool season perennial grass that has some legumes and forbs in it that have been rested all summer long and allowed to accumulate growth. And that's why I think it's so important if you're in Brome or fescue country that you utilize some summer annual pastures to allow those perennial pastures to accumulate uh, during the summer for fall grazing. Um, but there are some things that you can use as dedicated pastures that work exceptionally well, some of the summer annuals that work better for that fall grazing than for they do in for earlier grazing. This is a photo period sensitive sorghum sedan, brown midrib. Um, this is taken October 4th. So, um, and you can see those heads are just beginning to unfold. Um, photo period sensitives only flower once the day length gets below 12 hours and 20 minutes in the fall, which is you know, about mid September. So that's when the trigger is received. And then a couple weeks later is when the heads start to pop out. And by delaying that heading, you keep the plant in a, in a leaf production, in the business of producing leaves, growing roots, accumulating biomass. So um, this is uh, a great save it for September type forage because it doesn't lose its quality and it keeps accumulating biomass. So if you have, let's say you're grazing a warm season perennial and you want it to get off September 1st, allow the roots to recharge, and you need a very high productive, you got a small area that you can dedicate to September grazing, this is a great choice. Um, another source of grazing during that period, you know, the, the problem with sorghums during this period again, is in October, you have a risk of prussic acid poisoning if the animals are grazing sorghum regrowth that gets frosted. Um, another potential summer annual forage that you can grow in that fall period that does not have prussic acid is brown midrib corn. Now, brown midrib corn can also be used during the summer, um, but when it really really stands out is the growth that it makes in September and October because corn will grow at 50, 55 degrees. Sorghum won't. Sorghum needs 65 degrees in order to grow. How many days in September are the nights cold enough to shut down sorghum growth? It's pretty, even though the daytime gets kind of warmed up, those nighttime temperatures, I mean, a couple of weeks ago, we had nighttime temperatures in the upper 30s here, um, here in Kansas, and that really shut the sorghum down. But brown midrib corn can still, can recover from that and still keep growing up until you get a frost. And when it gets the frost, 
you can still keep grazing it. You don't have to pull off like you do with sorghum. So if it sounds like I'm a big fan of brown midrib corn for grazing this time of year, it's because I am, and I'll show you some examples here later on of, of what it can do. Um, another one is sunflower, and uh, just oilseed sunflower. And one of the cheapest cover crops you can grow. And animals, I put it in this early fall category, even though we, we often, I throw it in just about every summer annual mix that they'll let me because it's cheap. It's got some great soil benefits, some insect attraction for beneficial insects. But it also, these heads, once the heads develop, once it blooms, those heads start to develop, animals really, really like those heads. They will just snarf those heads up because they're full of oil and protein. And uh, the oil really gives animals a really nice slick appearance. Um, kind of improves their appearance after standing around the hot sun all summer. So it's a very good addition. Uh, another one that we've been using is uh, pumpkins and melons. And animals really don't like to graze the vines. So they're not useful in the vegetative state. But if you have a situation where you're stockpiling forage during the, where you grow it during the summer, but graze it in the fall, pumpkins and melons are fantastic. Um, we're also looking at some gourds, should be in this kind of the same category. The advantage gourds have is that they will climb up into the canopy and then have fruits hanging down, whereas the melons and the pumpkins uh, creep along the ground. There's probably some benefit to having both of them in a mix, but uh, pumpkins have really been a real rock star uh, in these fall, say, these mix, summer mixes that have been saved for fall grazing. Um, now, best cover crops for late fall grazing. I've got a combination right, right here that uh, is pretty tough to beat, uh, oats and, and radishes, but uh, we'll talk about some other plants that you can mix together. And again, even though I'm talking about these plants individually, you almost always get better results, in my experience, by having diversity out there. Diversity is important for animal diets. It's important for uh, soil benefit. It's important for not putting all your eggs in one basket. Big fan of diversity. Um, it's easy in hindsight to say, well, I should have planted all of this because it's the one that did the best. Well, what? There's no guarantee that's going to happen next year. Uh, for example, year in, year out, summer annuals, sorghum sedan is going to be your most productive plant. But if you had 100% sorghum sedan and sugar aphids hit, now you're locked in, or sugar cane aphids hit, now you're locked into spraying a couple times with insecticide, which has a non-grazing in, interval to save your crop. Now what do you do? When you have that diversity out there, you, you don't have to make that choice. I've never seen sugarcane aphids wipe out sorghum sedan in a diverse mixture. It's only in monocultures where it seems to be a big problem. We put th some things in there uh, to diversify the stand, a little uh, buckwheat in the mix to attract ladybugs and lacewings, and sugarcane aphids aren't a problem. We can oftentimes get more yeah, if you plant a monoculture of the best thing, you can hit a home run, but you can also strike out. And with diversity, you you get the benefits of the dietary, you know, the dietary selection. Animals can have a buffet rather than the same thing over and over again. They perform better, their health is better, the soil health is better, like the diversity. Um, so I'm going to put winter, or I guess cool season crops into two categories. The ones that make from a, an August or September planting, the ones that make a lot of fall biomass and then winter kill, and the ones that make a little bit of fall biomass and then live to provide spring grazing. So this first list, turnips, radishes, oats, black oats, spring field peas, spring barley, spring triticale, collards, rapeseed, kale, 
most of the brassicas and the spring cereals are the ones that provide the most fall biomass. And uh, these almost always winter kill in Kansas, so we don't get spring grazing out of them, um, at least not reliably. Now the things that are in the uh, lower fall biomass, you know, a plant can do one or two things when you plant it in the fall. It can either grow up and, w and produce a lot of feed in the fall, but it's going to winter kill because there's nothing below ground. Or it can put reserves below ground and then live through the spring. So what is in the second category, the low fall biomass, but over winter, rye, wheat, rye grass, annual rye grass and rye are not the same thing. Triticale, hairy vetch, balanza clover, crimson clover. Um, and these are more winter hardy options. They can also be planted later and survive the winter. So if you are planting after a, a row crop harvest, corn, soybeans, I would plant the second category. If you are planting in August or the first half of September, that opens up the option for the ones in the first category. Now, just because you are, you are not limited to one or the other. When I put together a cool season grazing mix, um, like for example, if I'm wanting something for both fall and spring grazing, I will usually do a full seeding rate, a full seeding rate of the second category and I will do about a half seeding rate of the first category. That way I can get both fall, I, I can get the high fall biomass and the high spring biomass at the same time. Um, even though the first category will winter kill, they'll still make a lot of biomass, add to my grazing. And because those do winter kill, I don't want too many of them to leave gaps in my stand. So I want, still want a full seeding rate of the second category. Let's take a look at some of these. Uh, radishes, one of the advantages of radishes is that if you look about where the soil line was on this plant, um, right in here, all this carbohydrate here is above ground and available for consumption along with all these leaves. So uh, because this root, about, 90, about the same digestibility as grain, you can get some really good animal performance. Now, one thing that's true with most brassicas, all brassicas actually, is that they're very low in fiber. They don't have enough fiber by themselves. Only put brassicas, if your goal is grazing, only put brassicas out in a mixture, never in a monoculture. Your animals will perform better and the other problem with getting too many brassicas in a mix is that they don't leave residue. That residue disappears like that. And you will have just absolutely bare soil. It's prone to erosion, prone to evaporation, and won't have as good a, back 10 years ago or so when radishes first became popular, people planted them. So I think I'll pl plant some of those radishes. Those look like they could break up a hard pan. Well, they can, but if you plant a solid stand of them, the competition is so great between plants, you don't get big roots like this. You get little pencil size roots. It's only when you have radishes that have room to grow and express themselves that you get big roots like this. And uh, if you plant them that thin, you're gonna have a whole bunch of gaps in between plants. That's where your diversity comes in. Tried. I, you know, radishes are fairly big seeded, so you can go maybe two to three pounds an acre of radishes. Um, no more than that. Uh, the other brassicas, I'd like no more than a pound per acre of your other brassicas. Um, and it's common, I'll, I'll do a pound of radishes and a pound of another brassica, like a turnip or a radish. Um, but that's, uh, and even with that, I like to plant my winter crops thick, really thick. I've just found that the thicker I plant them, the more feed I produce. So um, when I'm putting that 
two pounds of total brassicas in. Keep in mind that that's not with 30 pounds of rye. That's with 60 pounds of rye and 20 pounds of oats and 10 pounds of something else. That's in a very thick planted mix. And I like to generate feed. That's why I'm putting it out there. Uh, turnips, another one where the entire root system, now with radishes, they usually eat the root flush to the ground. With the turnips, they tend to pull the entire root out of the ground. So turnips have a very high carrying capacity, very high quality um, because of that big carbohydrate content. Um, again, leave no soil protection by themselves. And because the root is, you know, once you pull the root up, you don't get any regrowth either. So um, radishes are initially unpalatable to cattle, um, especially with calves. They, one of the last things that are eaten out of the mix usually. Uh, it's kind of surprising though that deer, deer seem to prefer radishes to turnips, which is surprising. Most other animals, it's the opposite. Uh, collards, collards as far as just grazing, ease of grazing management, total forage yield. Um, collards, I, I think, are the most grazing friendly brassica there is. Um, they just regrow incredibly fast. The leaves are very nutritious. They're the least bitter of the brassicas as far as animals, animal acceptance. Um, Animals seem to like collards the first brassica they eat. Um, another thing to plant in the fall is oats. And along with oats, I would include um, right there with oats, spring barley and spring triticale. They're all used essentially identically. Oats prefer acid soil. Uh, spring barley prefers higher pH soil. So if you've got you know calcareous spots or Salty spots, I would lean towards barley. Uh, whereas if you have acidic soil, usually in higher rainfall regions, I'd go with oats. Spring triticale seems to be very flexible, seems to thrive in both. Spring triticale is a little more productive, um, and but a little less, just slightly less palatable, especially after heading than the oats or spring barley. It's hard to beat oats for palatability. Um, unless you're talking black oats. And black oats are actually a winter oat, even though they, they don't reliably overwinter most years in Kansas, um, because they do have better cold tolerance than the spring oats, they will grow longer into the fall. Um, I believe it was last year, we had a, a cold snap in early November got down in the teens and then it warmed back up again. The white oats, the typical spring oats were done for, but the black oats kept on going. And I think we got about another six weeks of growth out of the black oats that we didn't out of the white oats. Now that doesn't happen every year, but it happens often enough that I consider black oats a better fall grazing plant than spring oats. They don't get as tall because they don't head out in the fall, uh, but I think as far as total biomass, because of that longer growing season, it probably better. Um, kale. Uh, this is kale uh, growing between rows of 60 inch corn up in North Dakota. Um, and this is a, a hybrid kale called a bayou kale. Uh, it's crossed with kale and rapeseed and you can see it's pretty doggone productive. Now, this uh, was corn grown in 60 inch rows. The kale was actually part of a mix, although it's hard to tell as productive as it was. Now, the idea behind showing you this picture is, we've talked a lot about sunlight and capturing sunlight. Well, once corn black layers become its physiological maturity, it's not doing anything with all that sunlight that's fallen on the field. So the idea behind the 60 inch rows here is not to increase corn yield, it doesn't. What it is, is to continue capturing sunlight after the corn is done and converted into something useful. So what we're doing here, uh, say we, this, this was uh, 
uh, up in North Dakota, so I wasn't personally involved. But what they're doing is using this kale, this cover crop mix, to capture sunlight and convert it into additional fall pasture. And one nice thing about this uh, bayou kale is it's, it's got fairly stiff stalks to it, so it sticks up above snow, which is pretty important in that part of the world. So uh, they're thinking that the combination of the corn stalks, kale, and then there's some other things like some sweet clover and so forth underneath, provide some really nice winter pasture. Okay, this is, uh, this is a stand of rye and turnips that were planted after, uh, after corn harvest. And this field was harvested about the 1st of September. And I think the impressive thing about it is that look at the volunteer corn. This is just the corn that came out of the combine. Look at how much biomass you know, this had about six weeks of growth before it hit the first frost. Look at how much biomass there is out there from the corn. You know, I, I spoke about the brown midrib corn earlier. This is why I'm so excited about it as fall grazing. Just because you're planting in August or even early September doesn't mean that warm season plants are off the table. What it does mean is that you have to pick some warm season plants that can tolerate a little cold. And corn is one of those. Now, I love adding corn to these cool season mixtures. Just think they're really, um, I mean, look at that. What is that, three foot tall? Probably four foot tall before the frost hits. You'll never get rye or triticale that tall in the fall. How much dry matter could you add to that field by putting a few pounds of corn out there. Have it in the, you know, solid pattern rather than just an ear to here or there that got passed out of the combine and put in the ground so that kernels actually have a better chance to grow. But uh, yeah, I, I just think of the possibilities here for a whole bunch of additional dry matter from throwing corn in these mixes. If you're planting yet in the month of August, I realize we're past that now, but just keep a note for next year. If you're planting at the end of August or even very early September, throw some corn in and see what you think. Now, winter pasture. The best winter pasture, most reliable um, and, and best quality dead of winter pasture is what I've got here. That stockpile tall fescue. It's not an annual, it's perennial, um, but there are very few options that really provide quality winter grazing. Now, there are ones that can provide a lot of quantity and I've been doing a lot of these lately. And that's your stockpiled forage sorghums. Now, stockpiled forage sorghum, you know, you can plant it depending on variety. Um, we'll use something we don't want to make hay, and we've done an entire, you know, I did a webinar earlier this summer on this as a full hour long topic, stockpiling sorghums for winter pasture. So um, if, if this is something that interests you, um, you know, send us an email and we can provide you a link to that webinar. Um, but it's not unusual at all for one acre of stockpiled sorghum to winter a cow for four months. And uh, it does become pretty important that you ration that grazing off. Don't just let them stomp the whole thing in the ground. Um, ration it off and uh, limit the trampling. And I think in a good productive year with the right genetics, might be possible to winter two, three, four cows an acre for four months um, if we get the genetics and the production right. And uh, the genetics that I really would like to have for this niche, there's just no perfect um, genetic package for doing this right now. But um, we're getting closer and closer every year and I'm excited by that. 
because I, I have people tell me that this is the most profitable uh, land use on their farm. And, uh, and they, they push the pencil and they, they tell me that this makes them more money than any other acre crop land on their farm. So spring grazing, got crimson clover here. Crimson clover um, used to be, the textbooks say, doesn't overwinter in Kansas. That used to be correct. Um, with newer varieties coming out. Uh, Kentucky Pride is one that has um, better winter hardiness. I'm pretty excited about. Because um, I like to see these beautiful blossoms in the spring. Now, if you travel in the south in the month of April, uh, you'll see these crimson clover blossoms all over. and They're just gorgeous. And it's a good nitrogen fixing plant to include in a in a crop rotation. Another winter annual legume is hairy vetch. Now, hairy vetch um, has uh, caught, caught some flack, been under fire as a grazing plant because it does pose a risk. Um, the plant itself is not toxic. What happens is the plant can get infected with a fusarium fungus. This happens in, in warm, wet weather. So as you progress into say June, the risk starts to increase. Um, the fusarium fungus produces what's a, a compound called a, a T2 mycotoxin. I'm not smart enough to know what a T2, T, T2 mycotoxin is, but the fungus actually produces a toxin to which some cattle are fatally allergic, potentially fatally allergic. Um, the symptoms are extreme. They're, um, the animal, but basically the skin just starts bubbling up and uh, it's like a big severe blistering. It's a photosensitization. It's when the animals are exposed to sunlight, which of course they will be when they're grazing, um, this blistering starts, and I mean big blisters, big chunks of skin fall off and, you know, basically peels them. And, and so it's, it's a very gruesome death when it occurs. It's also blistering of the internal organs. Um, not, not a pretty sight. Um, honestly, I, there's only been a few instances that I've ever heard of of it happening. Uh, it takes, you know, you have to have a genetically susceptible to animal. About 5% of Holstein and Angus are susceptible to this, about 2% of other cattle breeds. Um, of course, if your animals are genetically related, um, the odds if, of getting it, you know, if you use, you know, one bull for all your animals, that bull carries a susceptibility you know, you could have a, a train wreck. Um, we have customers that have planted thousands, hundreds of thousands of acres of hairy vetch and grazed it. We've never had a report. Um, I do know of some instances where an animal here or there was lost. Uh, I don't know if they're grazing pure stands, don't know the story, didn't sell them the seed. I do know that Kansas State University had an experimental herd, had 30, lost 10 overnight. And so um, it is a risk, it's something to be aware of. Like most risks, um, it's mitigated with diversity. Uh, don't like a pure stand to hairy vetch for grazing. Don't like much of a pure stand of anything for grazing. Um, dilution, diversity, you know, dilution, solution to pollution. Um, and uh, it's something to be aware of and educated about. So if you see the symptoms, you know what to do about it. If you do choose to graze hairy vetch, and I still graze hairy vetch. Um, but uh, it is something that I'm glad I know about. So any other further questions on hairy vetch, you send us an email. Um, it's, uh, I want people to 
I'm not going to tell you to not graze it. I'm not going to tell you to graze it. That's 100% safe. But I want you informed so that you can make your own decision. It is a, a very valuable legume agronomically, great nitrogen fixer, good at suppressing weeds, a lot of advantages to hairy bench. Triticale. Triticale, cross between wheat and rye. So it's got some, some hybrid vigor, plus it's got some characteristics from both parents. Um, they are a very good forage plant. Contrasting rye and triticale, um, rye will grow a little more in the winter than what triticale will. Triticale will, especially a beardless, you know, we've got a relatively beardless hybrid here in the photo. Um, triticale will usually out yield rye. It just takes a little while longer to get there. It heads out a little bit later and uh, the hybrid vigor usually means that you'll get a higher yield with triticale. Um, triticale, I don't think is quite as tough as rye. Uh, it doesn't take as poor, you know, poor soil as well as what rye does. Um, and doesn't sprout from the surface from a broadcast application as well as rye. Um, if you're wanting to put it up mechanically, for hay or chop it for silage, triticale all the way. Um, just so much better suited than what rye is. Um, but rye, I think for midwinter grazing, for getting that early spring bite, rye is tough to beat. Rye is also a better choice for suppressing weeds. Got very good allelopathy and uh, very good weed suppressor. Great at suppressing um, mare's tail and palmer amaranth in particular. Um, spring barley. Um, barley is a very high quality forage. It doesn't seem to produce as much total forage what triticale does or, or rye. Um, but it's exceptional quality. Unlike most other forages, um, it tends to maintain its quality. I've had mixtures of barley, triticale, had the animals out there while they were still, while the plant was heading out, and they ate all the barley heads off. The barley was completely consumed. The other plants were ignored once they headed out. So it does maintain quality very well after heading especially in comparison to your other cereals. Annual ryegrass, and I show you a close-up of the seed head of annual ryegrass. I meant to put a, a close-up of the forage. Annual ryegrass is not a cereal. It is a winter annual grass, uh, does not produce a grain. You can see the, the seed is very, very similar to fescue seed, if you've ever seeded a fescue lawn or a fescue pasture. Um, Annual ryegrass is different. It comes on later in the spring, but it will recover from grazing so much better. The regrowth is phenomenal. The quality is phenomenal. No other cool season plant has as high a sugar content as ryegrass. Um, this is one of the best plants there is for grass finishing. Um, imparts a very, very good flavor to the meat. Um, anytime you can use ryegrass in a grass finishing program, do so. Best steak I've ever eaten in my life came uh, from a steer that was harvested in Texas off the spring ryegrass flush. Just phenomenal. Very good flavor. Um, doesn't have the gamey flavor that a lot of times your uh, grass finished beet has. Big fan of using annual ryegrass. Um, so when do you plant this stuff? I've got, uh, of course this is being recorded, so I'm not gonna go through all these. You can look at it in your leisure, but there's all types of times, almost every month of the year, there's something you can plant to generate more forage on your property. Anytime there's a window where something isn't growing, you know, we've talked about capturing every photon. A photon is a terrible thing to waste. If you've got idle cropland or your neighbors have idle cropland and you can sweet talk them into a deal 
where they can sell you grazing rights. A lot of times people are happy to have the cover crop because they, they've heard of the benefit that grazing has on soil and it is a very definite benefit. Um, these are some windows where you can fit some grazing in. Okay, so uh, like Noah said earlier, this was our final webinar of the KGLC series. If you would like us to do things like this in the future, uh, please let us know. Send uh, Noah an email, me an email, or uh, you know, folks at KGLC or Mary Howell an email, and uh, let us know what you want. Again, pitching my books, uh, Managing Pasture, uh, $30 for it, The Drought Resilient Farm, $25 for it. Um, send me an email if you'd like one. We can get one shipped to you. And uh, thank you. Uh, appreciate it. It's been, been fun. Uh, what, uh, what are the questions that we've come up with so far here? Yeah, Dennis here is raising his hand. Dennis, I'm going to allow you to talk if you uh, have that ability. I don't know if you're looking to ask a question or... Well, mainly I was just saying thank you for the series. It's very informative and I hope you do continue with it. That's very Thanks, Dennis. Yeah. You're always you last night. Yes, you too. I was wondering if you made it up there today. <laughs> <laughs> yep. You better meet me before I say something stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I well, appreciate that, Dennis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Noah. Yeah, I, I see the the question there. That uh, how do we act, how do they access the recordings of the? You want to touch on that, Noah? Uh, well, I believe they are. We're still working. I think on getting them on the YouTube page, but they will be on the the YouTube page for Kansas Grazers here. Um, just trying to figure out the file size and how to best put them on there but they will be up there um if you're wanting them right away like if you're wanting this one tomorrow or something you want to send i do have them all uh recorded on zoom so i can send you that link if you need it but they will be all posted and more than likely if you have registered for these we will or mary will send out an email with all the recordings to, to anybody that is registered But I think that is it. Are there any other questions? If not, we'll probably go ahead and conclude. Uh, Dale, thanks again for your time and putting these presentations together. And do sure. uh, you have any final thoughts? I can't think of any. So we'll see what, what else 2020 brings us. <laughs> That's right. Probably. <laughs> Probably more webinars and more challenges than we know what to do with. Let's see. I'm trying to think. We got the burning hail yet, and we've got the <laughs> locust plagues we've already had. Um, I guess the frogs coming out of the rivers and won't be the next. So, yeah. Rivers turn into blood. We'll be looking for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. All uh, right. Rivers yeah. turning into blood might happen in the next election. It's hard to tell. <laughs> Oh man, I shouldn't laugh because I don't know how how uh, sarcastic that actually is. But yeah, that that there's sadly more truth than fiction to that. So uh, certainly, yep. certainly hope not. But. Well, I appreciate uh, all of you for tuning in each and every week. Hopefully, you guys got a lot out of it, and uh, we'll see you on the next session down the road. Thanks, Dale. We'll see you later. Thank you. Appreciate all the time and effort, Noah. Likewise. Take care.